every day, begin with banishing, then move on to the positive inversion of working with all of them and celebrating them. And then importantly, conclude with uh, conclude the preliminary part of the practice by offering yourself to them as well, because these discarnate entities, whether they are were previously human or maybe they never have been human, but if they're truly our guides and allies, they also have objectives and goals that they want to achieve. And when they're close and they have proven themselves, you should want to participate. They need help as well. So don't forget to do that part. Greetings, future fossils. In the spirit of the season and the longer ambit, the annular orbit we're tracing here and far beyond, I'm excited to finally get Stuart Davis on this show. Stuart is a fireball of explosive creative wizardry across music, comedy, video, painting. Someone that I have tracked, learned from, and followed, and loved, studied, and enjoyed for over 15 years now. But his latest project, the Aliens and Artists podcast, really ties the room together. It puts his overflowing cornucopia of creative prowess in context within an even deeper, weirder, and far more wonderful meta framing. Stu and I have known each other for a while, and I was relieved to be able to confess all of my own UFO encounters and their implications and consequences on his show, which, by the way, should be live right now. But it's a big bag to grab Stuart and wrestle him into a conversation about some of the thorniest questions I have ever contemplated on this show or ever. A POV that ought to render everything else right now some small, sad, side stage drama. We've all been waiting for 2020 to land on us, and I feel like this conversation really brings it home. But first, I want to thank Keith Singery, Caleb Meredith, Grant Kegel, The Cosmos, and Skytalker for hopping on the Patreon bandwagon, because, good God, it is no small feat to keep this show afloat, and... As the world gets weirder, I have delighted in the growing community and the superfluity of brilliance and creativity and sheer splendor of the folks listening to this show, meeting each other in the Facebook group, in the Discord server, coming together to discuss all that which is worth sharing. If you feel alone in the universe, or if this show helps you feel less alone in the universe. I hope you will bump on over to patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. Avail yourself of the copious gifts awaiting you there and enlist yourself in this strange non-local campfire burning asynchronously around the world. I just dropped a new single based on my own UFO experiences that you can find on all major streaming platforms the song You Don't Have to Move which we discuss the backstory of in great detail with Stuart on Aliens and Artists but for now get yourself a glass of water take a deep breath or three really unspool yourself from the street level shenanigans in which you may be currently enmeshed and get ready to hitch into this profound, bizarre, and awesome conversation. If you're like me, it's going to take you places that 
you totally don't expect. And the sheer surprise alone is worth the price of admission. Stuart Davis, everybody. Thanks for listening. Enjoy. I'm going to play two of his songs after the interview. Fear of Light and Universe Communion, because these are two extremely relevant and potent pieces of music. So stick around for that. It's just audio, but it's nice to see your smiling face. Whenever I see your smiling face, the books fall off my shelf. I notice, is this where you normally record? Yeah, check this out. This is, uh, well, usually there's a six foot baffle behind me, like a sound wall, uh, just to completely kill the room. And this is my closet. And I experimented for years. I, I built an ISO booth. Um, several different recording configurations. And the simple, stupid truth is that my closet is the best sounding space in my whole house. So I just gave in. It's the clothing. Completely. I mean, I'm surrounded by dozens and dozens of jackets and caftans, what have you. (laughs) I just think, you know, there's something, I'm glad I got to see the setting, however, however briefly, before we dive into this, because there's something beautifully ironic about you hosting a show that's all about coming out of the UFO closet <laughs> while actually in a oh, closet. That's so funny. Yes, the beautiful inversions that our universe tosses at us continue unabated. I don't know where you feel like starting. We're on day day two of autumn here in 2020. Oh my God. You is, um, can't yeah. autumn me enough. I can't be over autumned. That is like one of the finer things about. Oh, we're gonna have baby noises on this call. Goddess noises, we call them. Yes, yes. <laughs> Hold on, just a second. Here, here's a here's a cute baby for you to look at for a second. How here. you doing, gorgeous goddess? Look hey, at those look. locks. Oh my gosh, you're gonna. You're going to engender hair envy. Yes, she already for the rest of your life. engenders much much hair envy. Here's a baby. Go to mama. You want to put that on? I like that you have helmets behind you. I think you should wear those during your podcast. Oh, she wants Ada wants me to wear that helmet all the time. Well, she has not a, oblige. Uh, <laughs> she her uh her maternal grandparents, uh my wife's dad is an avid cyclist and they somehow found a book called just like grandpa about a kid getting ready with his grandpa to go on a bike trip and every and the guy the cartoon grandfather in the book looks just like nikki's dad it's like surreal it's it's weird uh and so we we you know we read the book just like papa and so she points to the bike helmet she's like papa hat papa she wants she's like (laughs) It's, which is good because I bought the helmet with a gift certificate I got from work, like a congratulations when I when I had the kid, yeah. and I, I bought it for myself. And I was like, "Well, that's good because you know what? The best gift I can give my my daughter is an intact cranium." Uh, well, I what I think of when I see helmets like that is Holland because no one wears them in Holland. They they have a more more than. Uh, a million bicycles. I don't remember the number. 1.3 million. There's more bicycles than there are people in Amsterdam. And that's not hyperbole. That's a fact. And then no one wears helmets. And it's this fascinating, cultural, rigid, inflexible principle that they have, which is just no helmets. Sounds Dutch. <laughs> it, it's, it's a very interesting thing for such a logical people. I'm making vast generalizations here but you know it's a pretty reasonable country on the whole and this one particular detail they just won't move on and i started researching how many people die each year from head injuries it's not as many as you might think but it's not none i don't know it reminds me of uh louis ck talking about the difference between europe and and the united states being guardrails (laughs) 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 like Everywhere you go, like every natural park or or sightseeing location in the U.S. is like heavily ringed off with cover your ass, anti-litigation guardrails. 
you know, and in Europe, I went to the literal edge of the continent in, in uh, Capo de Roca, Portugal, like got out on the edge of a cliff and sang a song to my wife across the Atlantic. And there was nary a guardrail to be seen yeah. to the horizon in either direction. It was glorious. It's fascinating. Another distinction is pickup trucks. We were filming in Holland last last December, I believe it was. And the camera crew who was with me, I had not noticed this, but probably because I didn't do much driving when I was living there for a couple of years, I just, we didn't have a car. It was just all bikes. And I pretty much stayed in the boat for two years. But this time when we were filming, we're driving all over the country. And on day four or five, my DP turned to us and said, I haven't seen one pickup truck in five days. And I had never thought of that, but it's true. There are no pickup trucks in the Netherlands. Like when they well, it's a street with they get a thing, van, right? you know, they have those big vans. That's how they move stuff. You'll see semis, vans, cars, no pickup trucks. Well, I'm, I'm curious. I think that we can immediately rocket or, or perhaps um, anti-gravity ourselves uh, from the mundane and into the truly strange Perfect. I, if you'll indulge a kind of a, a, a metaphorical stretch here, gladly. Which is that when I again when I was in in Portugal four years ago for a boom festival, I noticed in Lisbon, all the streets are very narrow. This is a very typical European thing. I have far less experience in Europe than than you, so that's what I'm drawing on. And I, I was thinking about driverless cars and how fucked driverless cars are in Europe compared to oh, yeah. in Austin, Texas, you know, that like so the streets in the United States, like, I don't know if you heard, I think there was a 99% invisible about how wide the streets of Salt Lake city are oh, God, that they're so wide that you can't cross them in the time allotted by a normal crosswalk count countdown. Yeah. <laughs> and so they had to change, they had to lengthen the countdown of the crosswalks to accommodate <laughs> these streets, which is, part of just the whole like manifest destiny BS of the United States of just like, we're going to sprawl out as much as we can because we have, you know, Absolutely. we have, the, we stole the space and you know, Europe is a lot more sort of uh, parsimonious or economical or, or whatever. And so like, i I guess, you know, this begs into a, a question, which I kind of want you to just take and run with. And that'll just prime the pump for this this discussion, which is on that same trip, I interviewed Mark Lee for episode 12 of this show. He's a, a visionary artist. And we had this whole conversation about he's really uh, an, a proponent and advocate of zero point energy, mm -hmm. which I know is like a thing that comes up a lot in the UFO lore. Yeah. And um, I had this this whole question with him. We explored about why it is that maybe you know, maybe we don't have unlimited free energy right now as a species because we would blow ourselves up. And that it's actually, it's not some sort of evil conspiracy to hide this knowledge from us. It's that it's a legitimate, you know, perhaps sort of like paternalistic, you know, perhaps liberty violating, you know, in some sense right. kind of a thing. But like, so is keeping your kid out of the cabinet under the sink and like making sure they don't eat Drano. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I don't know, like here we are. And I feel like there's a way that you and I in this, in this episode can reconcile, can square the absolutely zany, fantastical, but uh, hyper real stuff that you talk about on your show and the <laughs> mundane realities of our, our domestic householder lives, you know, I love it. You're already doing that mm. so beautifully. And the show being consecrated by your gorgeous child. That's a, that's also another great way to start. Um, What a great consideration. And one of the things that pops up for me initially in considering that is once you have a developmental frame a developmental lens on the world it's very hard to shake and so you could get that through integral you could get it through simple you know psychology one-on-one -on -one in a high school will introduce you to the developmental models of several several different individuals and once you begin to include that not necessarily as 
your only way of looking at things, of course, but when it becomes one of the integers in your equation, it's super hard to shake it. So when I think about something like zero point energy and your great analogy about it's not some conspiracy that we don't let our kids go into the sink and drink Drano, there's all kinds of filters and pardon the reference guardrails in our in our culture. <laughs> and I think that that's the first thing that comes up for me in regards to zero point energy, or for that matter, very often in the UFO enigma. And I've oddly and counterintuitively developed more compassion and appreciation for the kind of puzzles that people in the black world, in non-auditable programs, be they corporations, governments, military, whatever it is, they have a lot of really tough questions to try to contend with, attempting to protect us. And to be honest, when you look at something like zero point energy, or the UFO stuff, there are there's not an abundance of great answers. There's not some super satisfying way to go about any of this. And with zero point energy, I think what you brought up is a great example of just forecasting and attempting to anticipate even the near term of the implications. Uh, of course, someone like a Stephen Greer is right in pointing out the great benefits, the way that we could eliminate so many of our problems if Zero Point was brought online and put into the assembly, the Ford assembly line of uh, however we would manufacture those. That stuff could be all true, although it's fair to say it also could be true without zero point energy. We have enough food. We have enough energy. We have available technology that could completely transfigure cross-culturally over all of the continents and systems if, if we had the gumption and the focus and the wherewithal to get there. So zero point being wonderful, and I understand at least enough, I'm no expert, but I understand at least, at least enough to know why it's so attractive and magnetic, and there's that utopian sense about it. But then when you bring in the developmental question, and you could do it with anything, a nuclear weapon, what is a nuclear weapon in the hands of a pathologically very low developed person? It's super dangerous. And that mix that we have, that's already a problem with that, is just going to continue ad nauseum unless there's some radical shift forward, backward, whatever it is that takes this kind of stuff online. We're never not going to live with this riddle. This riddle exists there for a stick. What What is a a cave bear's femur bone in the wrong hands? It's a weapon. <laughs> it's like that <laughs> developmental riddle has always been with us and always will be with us. But the way that I'm walking around it initially before I hand the baton back to you is just that I have developed more appreciation for the folks that let's imagine are in possession of a zero point energy. Let's imagine the Bob Lazars of the world that that whole dimension is verifiably true and that stuff exists. Then the notion that you're already anticipating with what happens and how we can developmentally operate ethically safely to advance for all I don't think anybody has an answer to that question. I certainly don't. Mm -hmm. There's, it's just, and that's, you know, the vertical thing is only one aspect of it. Um, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know how we can developmentally get ourselves to a place. It feels like we're on this fulcrum, we're on this threshold and we're teetering. And the question is like, are we going to get, are enough of us going to get to the other side of this thing to manifest the love and focus that's, available to us, but thus far has been aborted repeatedly. And I think the last time you and I spoke, we talked about this 50-50 feeling, I believe. I don't think we put it that way, but this notion of just like, God, what a dead heat we're in between our own self-destructive imperatives and this great potential hope. So that I know is not much of an answer, but that's the feeling that's there for me when I look at it. What feeling is there for you? I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, you know accelerationism and this you know this idea for folks who really want a, a superb primer on it Gordon White and James Ellis just put out a, a dual podcast between Rune Soup and Hermetics that I listened to the other 
that was extremely yeah. good. And and like looking at this, you know, that's that's like one angle looking at it from you know magical practitioners about what a lot of people would just call capitalism, but which arguably, you know, from the physical sciences seems to be the way that we're telling our entire like cosmological story now in the West about how you know this is a you know evolution is a thermodynamic process it's self organizing and it ratchets up and it finds economies of scale and it's super exponentially innovative but there's this thing where where adherence to the church of accelerationism be they you know capital fetishists or you know techno utopians or whatever they ignore the fact that every innovation precipitates a new crisis that then has to be resolved oh. by an even more rapid cycle of innovation that precipitates even more rapid crisis. And so the most sober people I've ever spoken to look at this and they say, well, clearly collapse is imminent. And it's just a matter of, you know, the, the real argument is, you know, are we going to get a, a nice loaf of bread out of this or is it going to deflate like a souffle that rose too fast? Mm. You know, do we find some sort of rainforest balance where all the loops of manufacturing close themselves, basically? And part of this thing is the system running out of space to expand and then starting to eat itself. And does it eat itself in a sustainable way or does it eat itself in a gross cannibal way? Right. You know, like, <laughs> so for me, you know, this this begs the question. I'm going to try and get better at asking these questions in a in a, <laughs> a faster way. But like your show, which by now I have urged people to listen to for weeks. So if you're just coming to this episode, I've already said in the intro, you should stop and go back and listen to like half a dozen episodes of Aliens and Artists. But there's this there's this theme in your show that I, I really admire is insofar as it's an oral history project about the er pattern that these extraterrestrial or extra dimensional encounters, whatever they however we interpret them have this consistent injunction to participate in the creativity. Uh, you know, they, they're like, you know, there's one thing that's like, oh, well, they're not giving us these technologies. But then there's this other side, which is actually, <laughs> arguably, mm, a ton of new yeah. stuff has come out of these encounters and, you yeah. know, and, and technological yeah. and artistic and all kinds of bizarre stuff. Kate Torvaldson talking about how she's writing a physics textbook from all of this stuff, you know, and she yeah. can just see the pieces yeah. of the cosmos there, right. like Tesla. So it gets back to that question, which is, is this sort of like a world bank deal where we're, we're getting, we're, we're already biting off more than we can chew, you know, like we've, we've been given a loan we can't repay or what? I don't know. Mm. Great thoughts. And I concur with your sentiment around, I would just put it as our misinterpretation of the kinds of gifts that are being transmitted and transferred to us in these contact experiences. And I have to qualify it by saying I'm going to talk about positive ones because there's also the flip side. There's plenty of real negative shit going down. And this is a very nuanced and sophisticated puzzle that we're working our way through. However, one thing we can say with confidence, particularly in the aliens and artists domain and this focal point around how creativity is adjusted, amplified by contact it's just screamingly clear that even the slightest brevity of interaction doesn't even have to be face-to-face, quote-unquote, contact. The briefest encounter with craft, with anomalous phenomena, entities, even discarnate or incorporeal or non-physically dimensional intelligences, just radically alters the nature and volume of creativity that comes forth from these people. And so if you just to tee up the first 100 episodes, let's say, of Aliens and Artists, and by, by the way, yours is coming up, and it's Dude, I... a fucking doozy. So excited for people to hear your episodes. But the, the nature of what is being offered to us is such a beautiful and unique kind of gift because unlike here's a piece of technology or we're going to give you this 
zero point energy. We're going to give you a craft that's sentient and will embed itself into your consciousness. It can be operated from the interior of the pilot. And instead of that kind of gift, typically, maybe there's a few of those. I don't know. I don't know what the nature, the veracity of those accounts are, etc. But what we do know and is available to us in great abundance is what happens to the human being? What happens to the creativity? What happens to the artist? And very often we could say the vast majority, at, at least of the participants and aliens and artists, they go supernova. Their creativity goes nova. And the uh, Kat Torvaldson is a great example. There's two of her episodes that are up recently. And this is a woman with 35 implants. That's not conjecture. They've been documented through x-rays and mag magnets. Fascinating episode. She has this real equ Scandinavian equanimity, let's call it, and, and a resounding, brilliant mind. And the combination of those two things brings this really wonderful quality of just hyper explosive novelty and creativity, but also this grounded sanity. And I love hearing her share her account for some, those are two of the reasons that I immediately was drawn to it. But what she creates from paintings to the book that you're describing, which is this new kind of cosmology, including quantum mechanics and almost a Leonardo approach to a new cosmology, her intelligence and the creativity we see pouring forth from her is a great example. She's an exemplar of what we might call an archetypal aliens and artist person. And what I think is also interesting about that gift is that clearly there's a selection, there's an intention, there's, uh, I would for my part, say a desire from many of these entities to not give us something, but to give us ourselves, to evoke from us a better version of ourselves. A, because that's what's better for us. B, because I would say in the best of situations, that's the spirit of love. And then C, because they would like to have a relationship with deep, amazing beings, just as anyone would. They'd prefer to have healthy, creative, wonderful, vibrant friends and neighbors rather than cretins who are attempting <laughs> to undo each other at every turn. And I think that's a beautiful gift. I think it's amazing and fascinating. And it's one reason that every time I do an episode of Aliens and Artists, it's such a fucking blast. It's so fascinating. First of all, I've never talked to an, I just love artists. I love artists so much. They're one of my favorite things about planet Earth certainly one of my very favorite things about humanity. So already talking to an artist, just 99.9% .9 of the time, that's so fantastic. That alone is a gift. And then when you get into them sharing these very personal stories, and often they, they have not talked about them before, or they've kept them private for reasons that are quite understandable. Getting into these conversations with these artists is just a total privilege. And that's a big part of why. And that was very much the case with you as well. I think I said in that interview, it, it's just funny how so many of the people that I met through Integral back in like the early 2000s are coming out of this particular closet right now. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how that has tracked. And, you know, you, you cannot really spend any serious amount of time in this folklore, which, you know, I say that because it's just like, it's such a bottomless pit of curiosity and and in many cases like you know you're talking about having kind of sympathy for the devil you've seen mirage men right yeah that documentary yeah yeah so like that whole notion of misdirection at multiple levels in multiple directions where true things are being couched in false things and and it's just it's interesting that we all uh, of the the people that i uh encountered in that completely different space where all of this stuff was utterly verboten are now, you know, feel like it's time to step forward and talk about it. But that's only sort of a tangent to the next question I had for you, which is about how the first time that I ever heard you come out on somebody else's show and talk about your, your experiences with mantis aliens was on weird studies. And 
I like to think of them as a sister show. They're I, I love those guys so much. They most definitely. Yeah. I remember on that show, you talked about how you were not willing to stake an ontological claim on your experiences, and that was just a couple of years ago. And now it feels like you're you're very right. very comfortable yeah. occupying a sort of a different stance on this. And I'm curious to know f- what changed for you between this to me at the time you know your your weird studies conversation seemed like such a rigorous and even obstinate devotion to not knowing what the hell was going on in your life and then you know the, and, and at that point it yeah. had been going on already yeah. for like eight years and then like within a year you're on a completely different footing and i'm wondering what changed and how you tell the story of what changed for you there yeah what a great question and to begin with, I want to join in your enthusiastic celebration of weird studies, which I'm sure you've referenced many times. I have as well. JF's been on Aliens and Artists, and Phil's definitely going to come on if he will agree to. Um, I just love them so much. And I love the community that you're describing of, of folks from yourself, me, Sean Hargens, uh, Sean Asbjorn Hargens, sorry. Um and we could make quite a list. It's growing, it's expanding, and you're right. There's there's a migration underway from within the integral class of 90 or whatever to, but also more generally, it's spiritual communities, mystical community, uh, communities, animistic communities. There's something underway. And I think what you're noting there is significant, although still emergent enough for us to keep guessing and prognosticating about where ultimately it's going to go. So just yes to that. In regards to this great question, what happened in the last two years to change how I'm willing to talk about this and how I characterize it? Because you're right, during weird studies, I was quite obstinate about not knowing what it was. And within a year of doing that show, I began to feel an acute experience of let's just call it unethical resistance, where the exterior of my life and the way that I was characterizing my experiences didn't really match the inner knowing. And there's a couple reasons for that. One being that there's there's some things I've experienced that I have not talked about. And I probably will at some point. But some of the experiences that I've had that I've not talked about <laughs> were clarifying and unconfusing. They initiated an argument between myself, the mantis entity, and then also just to, just to fucking walk us all the way into Weirdville. For the past several years, I've also been in a daily meditation practice with the goddess Psyche, which is probably among all of the things in Earth spiritual, the Greek pantheon was the <laughs> least interesting thing on planet Earth to me. It's I, nothing, flat zero. But we can discuss that later if you want. It's just to tangentially say that there began a argument, a three-way argument between this mantis entity, myself, and the goddess Psyche, who I work with. And the argument was basically, you are not telling the truth. You're not being honest. You are mischaracterizing what your own convictions, knowing, and experiences are. And it's actually not helpful to you. And it causes a kind of distortion and propagation of unhelpful noise in this conversation among the community. And coupled with that was this knowing that a feeling and and a strong desire to want to help other experiencers, including getting certified as a transpersonal hypnotherapist and um, starting this program called Something from Nothing and working with more artists and with more experiencers one-on-one in sessions. I knew that if I didn't get more honest and transparent about what at least I felt to be the case, that I was inhibiting the truth, my ethics, and my ability to be available to other experiencers to help them. So I went into another period of I argued with this mantis entity and with the goddess psyche and just really did not want to be the guy to come out and say for example and I think this is probably the most distilled personification and expression 
of what it is I'm talking about that I didn't want to say publicly is this piece that I wrote on my blog called. Oh, good. Uh, that was the next question I had for you. So we'll go right into it. Yeah. Hum, uh, the forfeiture of human sovereignty and the ET presence. So there's 10, right. There's a blog I wrote of these 10 things and they basically were the truth telling of what in my heart I felt and knew emotionally, spiritually, not, uh, not empirically, obviously, but the conviction and the knowledge and the fact that I was getting pushed on both sides, not only from the mantis entity, but also from the goddess psyche. Um, let's just say that those within my circle were getting frustrated with me. So that blog was the real crossover the event horizon occasion for me where I just bit the bullet after much boxing and dodging and slippery behavior and finally wrote that and then from that issued other things the podcast is certainly one of them it's a big one but basically since i wrote the blog launched the podcast and began working with experiencers and just being more honest about for instance with these mantis entities i i will now say i feel and know from my spiritual emotional cogniz uh, cognition that these entities exist when we don't think about them, that they're at the top of the holarchy, that they're seen in waking, dreaming, altered state, other dimensional, uh, entheogenic experiences, virtually every single state region you can map in human experiences. These entities show up. They show up with great consistency about what they're doing, why they're doing it, at least within a certain range of, of items on the menu. And what they say and wish for and from us. There's a consistency there that goes back so long and across such a great constellation of places and experiences that I just felt like I'm full of shit if I pretend that this is not going on in the fashion that it is. And my desire to bracket it and put it into this, oh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, who fucking knows? I was just like, that's not actually honest. I now... On the flip of that is there's a great enormity of mystery. The enigma is still there. I'm not telling you that I know everything that's going on and have all the answers. I don't. I'm completely fucking confused and baffled about the majority of things that are attending these highly strange entities, phenomena, etc. It's a big, big mystery. But I felt like if I didn't get more honest in the way that you're asking, that I was really becoming a kind of asshole within the lineage. And I was undermining myself and a lot of other people. So that's why I did that. And that's where the change came from. Yeah, it's, an, you know, it's interesting to juxtapose that journey for you with Rick Strassman, who, you know, most listeners of this show, I'm sure will know was the guy who rebooted psychedelic science in the United States. You know, he was able to do the clinical DMT trials back in the 90s, but he was a very active member of his Zen community. Right. And he was totally ostracized when they found out that he was doing this work and that he was <laughs> he was reporting, you know, that he was he was starting to develop a you know sympathetic leaning toward these utterly consistent, as you just said, reports from the patients of his DMT trials that they were encountering these these intelligent non-human oh, yeah. presences in this altered state. And so the last chapter of DMT, The Spirit Molecule, is about trying to reconcile his new weird ontology, which, you know, at the time he was a very, I mean, I don't know where, I don't know his story oh, now. Yeah. You know, it's been over 25 years, I'm sure by now he's gone in there on his own. But at the time he was writing as, you know, a very careful uh, researcher who was not, he was, he was letting other people look down that particular microscope and it was simply the talking about it. That was a problem. And he was kicked out of his, of his community of practice. And so this last chapter is about his yeah. attempts to reconcile his own spiritual practice and the importance of that that Sangha with the importance of his adherence to what he believes to be conditionally and apparitionally true, that there's, there's gotta be a way to talk about, yeah. you know, chop wood, carry water. And also like maybe um, 
have implants what would the the weird zen alien <laughs> be like you know have implants talk to mantises <laughs> it's such a great formulation you've shared there and i have a lot of energy around this or did uh, not in not so much in the last five years but i was a zen practitioner primarily for over two decades and privately spoke with a lot of zen not a lot of zen masters i would say five over perhaps 20 years i i attempted to broach this subject and a few of them that i've worked very closely with including genpo roshi who initiated me uh into the in, into his white plum lineage but also just a bunch of you know you're promiscuous it's not a huge community you end up seeing a lot of teachers in a lot of different situations so you get the opportunity to ask these kind of questions eventually the juxtaposition that i find fascinating is that pretty much unanimously all of my zen teachers or they weren't all mine but all the zen teachers i spoke to had similar reactions which was not negating it or dismissing it saying okay those are interesting experiences but just like anything else that arises in your awareness bring your attention back to your breath get it back in your anchored witnessing awareness and let it come and go etc that's a paraphrasing uh, of an amalgamation of those responses and then juxtapose that with john mack who was a close friend of mine and was the head of psychiatry at harvard and was pioneer researcher and abduction and contact experiences. And as I'm sure you're, many of your listeners know, took a hell of a beating, almost got stripped of his status as an academic and, you know, wanted many, a population of folks at Harvard wanted him to be removed and ostracized kind of in the way that I would guess like a parallel to the Strassman sort of thing in Zen. And, but what happened was he was eventually vindicated but john and i he used to take me to all of these conferences ufo conferences experiencer conferences and he also just had access of course a pulitzer prize winning author an interesting guy in the field of psychiatry like this doing this work he could pretty much go and talk to almost anyone he wanted to so he went to hang out <laughs> with the dalai lama and True story. He told me, I just sat down and started talking. I was like, this, this is the work I'm doing. These are the abductions. These are the experiencers. Here's what they're reporting. And the Dalai Lama almost interrupted him, didn't probably technically interrupted him, but just cut to the chase and said, yeah, these entities exist. They occupy a fold dimensionally that is adjacent to ours and our behavior <laughs> is radically impinging upon and hurting them. <laughs> they have, their hand has been forced. <laughs> He was not confused about it. Now, I got this directly from John, so I'll qualify it saying I wasn't just sitting there with the Dalai Lama, but John Mack was not a liar. He didn't exaggerate or mischaracterize things. He was a very astute, careful individual in regards to all of this, and that's flat out what the Dalai Lama just cut to the chase and told him. And when you sit, put the Vajrayana lineage in one hand and then the Zen lineage in the other, and you feel the texture of those different responses you can also appreciate how i've gradually probably taken more things off the vajrayana menu in an approach to this all the shamanic practitioners that i were working with or that i was working with around the time of man meets mantis i had pulled together these shamanic practitioners to help me try to come to clarity around what these i wanted to know basically are these mantis is the mantis entity i interacted with what it says it is is it accurately presenting itself to me or am i being deceived so i was working with a small stable of these shamanic practitioners they were all from the vajrayana lineage and the vajrayana lineage didn't even flinch at the idea of <laughs> hey these not non-human entities are showing up in my life how do i deal with it what do i do about it they were like here here's a handful of things we can begin with. Whereas in Zen, and I'm not saying all this to knock Zen. I don't think we need Zen to be the toolbox that responds to this. There's nothing wrong with Zen in this sense. It's not broken. I'm not criticizing it for that regard. I'm just saying I ended, ended up having to go other places and get other tools, and that's fine. They were available. But I think your Strassman story is funny and understandable, and I, I would personally prefer a version of zen that didn't ostracize people 
for those kinds of things. Maybe we're getting there. I don't know. I've kind of phased out of it. Uh, I practice by myself now. That's another interesting thread, it seems, in at least the you, me, and Sean Esper and Hargens thing is that, you know, so much of this, and I think we talked about this a little bit when I was on your show, that so much of this is tied up with some sort of reproductive injunction. I wonder what the Dalai Lama thinks about that. That, Like, you know, when Sean told his story on Future Fossils also, or a little bit of it, and about how his encounters were correlated with his becoming a father and his like losing time to be part of a member of a community of practitioners, which to me feels very much akin to, again, another nod to weird studies to talk about the conditions under which one might wander away from their village and to the, you know, to the edge of the wood where they're going to encounter the Fae or the white people you know, that there's something about yeah. the domestic life that is, at least in the West, and it, especially, I would say, I guess, probably most acutely in the United States, very isolating. And I would say some of my weirdest people say, oh, yeah, yeah. becoming a parent is psychedelic. That's a whole other subject. There's a whole other category <laughs> of weird shit that rears its head, I think, simply because of some combination like you know again to to draw in on tibetan buddhism i think one of the first books i read i was actually out of the the bone tradition was you know tenzin wang yel rinpoche's uh the tibetan yogas of dream and sleep and they talk about you know waking monks standing vigil over or each other and then waking them up periodically like preventing them from getting decent sleep and how that was a you know, a key technology in the cultivation of a a lucid dreaming practice. And, you know, there's like the 3 a.m. witching hour type thing about melatonin and DMT cycles in the brain. And just like (laughs) sleep deprivation seems potentially correlated with these visitations. We could drill in there or uh, let's say we could probe that or... Uh, I, I I would love to ask you a little bit more about this this blog that you wrote on the forfeiture of human sovereignty, which actually now now that I think about it is is does rhyme at least with parenthood. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I, I I didn't gap for a second. I was yeah. just um, I wanted to pull up the blog actually, um, and then to also just in passing at liminal window this funny i have two thoughts on the 3 a.m funny little portal where the membrane seems to thin that's totally a thing and two things about it a feature of my nocturnal experiences to this day not to to this day i would say through into this year this ridiculous quality continues and because I've been fastidious about documented everything, keep a really detailed journal, including all the times and just everything that can be written down. I always do write down anytime something strange happens. And so one of the things that goes on is that uh, people will hear this if they go to the documentary and listen, if they haven't yet. Um, one of the things that goes on is that these entities like to begin at 303, 313, or 333. And they do so by activating either coyotes or owls, uh, which go crazy for about a minute. Then they stop on a dime as though somebody pushed stop on a tape recorder. And then the experience begins. And then when it's done, they bookend it. And this stupid, adolescent, ridiculous facet of 303, 313, 333, which I cringe to even report because it's so corny. It always reminds me of uh, the film director who I'm going to forget his name. I know you'll know this story. He and his friend saw a UFO in the way it's Del Toro, maybe. I think that might be his name. They saw a UFO and he's (laughs) speaking about it. He's like, yes, we saw this UFO. It was the most terrifying experience of my entire life. And the design was horrible. He just said the the aesthetics of this UFO were ridiculous. It looked stupid in the sky. I can't believe how dumb it was. I, you know, it terrified me. Yes, and it was 
one of the most ex- important experiences. I'm paraphrasing entirely, but half of his description was this stupid, <laughs> ugly UFO, which was so poorly designed. Who made this thing? Like, it was just this artist bitching about the aesthetic quality of this UFO. And I've always loved that because I feel the same feeling when I think about that window between 303. I'm, I'm, of the mind of just wake me up at three. Who the fuck? Why 303? It's so stupid. You're going to make, now I'll have to talk about that and say that's a feature. Why is that happening? It's so corny. Like an 11 year old boy is behind this initiation and contact. So that is part of it. Then the other half is that when I looked in a little deeper to why might they show such a preference aside from that corny detail to this, window between three and three thirty. We know that's the witching hour. We know that's a window important in so many of the esoteric and mystical and occult traditions. But I found a more practical potential description, which is that the magnetic field of the planet where I'm located on Earth, when I hit that three to three thirty window or, or anyone around me, there's a magnetic shift because of our position in relationship to the sun, which is a real utilitarian convenience for them. And so that might be a factor. I'm not sure whether or not. So in moving on to the uh, to the blog thing, just in general, what, what do you want to speak about in general? Like, do you want to go through the points one by one or start with a more yeah. general well, let's, umbrella let's, about yeah. let's what start it says? Broad and, and why and it's coarse like grained. It. And then I guess we'll dive in as as much as it feels appropriate to do so. I think, you know, I will obviously link to this from the show notes. So go there and read this and we don't have to recapitulate it verbatim. But you know, I would like to get into a little bit more about just the broad strokes of what this says. And again, why you wrote it in response to this argument you were having with Psyche, which is interesting. I have also had a very... Uh, you know, a potent, perhaps not quite as intimate as yours, but like, you know, there's, there's been something about the Eros and Psyche myth and also the uh, Pygmalion and Galatea that has floated me Mm. in some way or, or, you know, provided sort of a, a mythological circus tent stake for the last many, many years. So it's curious that this, that this piece came out of that, that, you know, if this isn't obvious in, in the conversation already that, you know, there's something I guess that's actually good, you know, Psyche on one end and Galatea on the other, that there's something I'm trying to reconcile about, you know, if we are, as this apocryphal story of John Mack and the Dalai Lama, if we are impinging on another realm, what does that have to do with our technological development and our total disregard for the sovereignty of other beings, both visible, both recognized and unrecognized Mm -hmm. on the planet that we at least (laughs) for now seem to be able to agree that we all inhabit, you know? Yeah. So beautifully put and has become such a foundational and increasingly amplified experience for me, which is a recognizing the personhood of that tree, sure, that dog, yes, but also non-physical beings, fey, liminal intelligences, uh, dimensional, whatever they may be, the populace that is teeming to the cosmos, including in our neighborhood. And you have done such great work in enriching and expanding this exact question, as has Weird Studies, as has Gordon. Uh, as one of the big influences and finds for me was Gordon's Rune Soup podcast coming into this. And so that's a big part of this equation around Psyche and this mantis entity, which <laughs> if you would have told me 10 years ago that I would have said that sentence, I would have laughed probably the way that I did just now. And the argument basically teeters in part on this granting personhood, not only recognizing the interiority, the personhood, the intelligence, the locus of self, which can inhabit and drive so many variety of manner and beings manifested in the cosmos, the infinite way that the cosmos can bring forth 
life intelligence and interiority through these exteriors and these bodies, let's call them all these different kind of bodies, is endless and limitless. And so it's beginning with recognizing that and then working to respect and deepen the recognition of sovereignty in each of these types of intelligences. So for me, when this mantis entity came into my life, so to speak, and when Psyche came into my life, the strange beginning part of this sovereignty issue was a culmination of me understanding that the way human beings were behaving toward each other was undermining and eroding our sovereignty. And an extension of that is how we behave in relationship to other intelligences and other beings, including mantid entities, including the fey folk, whoever it may be, beginning though with ourselves, the way that we have been handed an opportunity to be stewards of this planet, the way that we have been granted an opportunity to usher and protect life, and then the way that we just blow that all to kingdom come and shit on it every day in a variety of fashion, including things like our food system, but also in more mundane ways in how we interact with ourselves and each other. And what was pointed out to me by this mantis entity was that no one is taking our sovereignty from us. We're forfeiting it over and over and over. We're in a habituated pattern of forfeiting our sovereignty, and it's utterly radically undermining our potential and future as cosmic neighbors and citizens. And if we don't correct that, our future as cosmic citizens, which is certain, we we either are going to be cosmic citizens, we already are actually, or we're not going to exist. And so by not choosing sovereignty and protection of each other and love and sovereignty and protection of animals and, and life, we're <laughs> selecting for a subservient enslavement of ourselves in relationship to many other kinds of entities. And also, we're signaling externally, just in a very general fashion, that because we behave this way, it's okay for us to be treated this way by other ent opportunistic entities that don't have great intentions. And so the mantis entity was basically telling me, the first step is you have to claim your sovereignty, you have to announce it, protect it, and then you have to take up practices and cultural social behaviors that reinforce that and create these little embassies of your sovereignty being claimed and protected. And a big way you do that is claiming and protecting it, recognizing it for others, whether it's your dog or non-physical beings in the neighborhood. So the argument began around... A psyche and the mantis, they don't agree on everything, but one of the things they did agree on was this. You need to say this, you need to live it, and you need to be honest about it because it's a serious fucking issue and shit is getting really scary. And you're right about the acceleration. Shit is getting scarier faster and in ways that are super hard to anticipate and adjust for as they're occurring. So their basic one thing they agreed on was we both agree on this, this comes first, and then these other items. And the dynamic in the argument between the mantid entity and psyche, you know, they don't necessarily want the same thing, but they are willing to have this micro council in which psyche advocates and protects humanity. She is much more clearly demarcated on the side of protection for human souls and her practices and, and the recitations and the practices that she's taught me are all about that. The mantid entity has more advocated for beginning with details such as not all mantid entities are part of the abduction and hybridization program. Not all mantid entities are part of the traumatization of the human species, and but some are. But there are mantis entities that want to work with human beings and are willing to respect and recognize our sovereignty. And this particular one that I've had contact with has advocated that you should be working with me. Every year you fuck around and stall and delay and do nothing is a year lost in which some progress could be made because this particular one is like, I'm one of those that goes back into the mix of things on the other side, let's call it in air quotes, and advocates <laughs> that human beings should be included and respected in the future of what's going to go down in the coming millennia. 
So that, as you can see, is a setup for the kind of conversation that this three-way conversation was having because I didn't feel great enthusiasm about getting in with the Mantis in that fashion. And the fact that they both agreed on this one point was what pushed me over that hurdle to get into the larger content of the blog. I'll pause there and ask for your reflections. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that comes up again, I've never actually had a, a conversation with Gordon White. One of the, but if I were to have one, one That's of the okay, things I, I think it. it would orbit this question of sovereignty because I feel like he has a very nuanced take on it, and it's important, I think, for us to differentiate ways that you know this is not an absolute or binary or simple, discrete kind of subject. Because I think of two things when you're telling this story about your relationship with your cosmic destiny broker, you know, this, <laughs> this is being that's, that, you know, is saying, I'm, go you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going back and, and, uh, you know, speaking for the trees or, or however, that this is very much like if we were the, indigenous peoples of the Amazon for whom Jeremy Narby was uh, acting as an intermediary against those large uh, pharmaceutical companies that wanted to exploit them for their ethnobotanical wisdom. You know, I went, when I had Sean on the show, mm. Sean was talking about the class of weird phenomena in which we are the ghosts to the ghosts. And it just makes me think of to what extent is being a visitor mm. to this planet, just absolutely bizarre, which actually there's a Stuart Davis piece for this. You know, you did that. Like one of the funniest things I've ever heard was you narrating the experience of, of being an extraterrestrial that has incarnated into a human body and, and like reporting back. I'll link to that in the show notes for people too. Like that was, you know, it was such a stroke <laughs> of genius, but like, so this thing about, you know, um, when William Irwin Thompson talks about the resurgence of, of right-wing extremism that we're experiencing in this country right now as what he calls a ghost dance of the rednecks. You know, what he means is sort of, you know, this sort of last hurrah of a mm. particular way of relating that has been swept aside by greater historical forces, um, you know, or, or is like, you know, passing into into uh, history, the new world history in a way. And I think that there's something about our fixation on autonomy in the modern era that is, uh, at least now in 2020, kind of of the same flavor. It's like the ghost dance of the non-cosmopolitan yeah. human being. But it's like, again, like this issue of yeah. sovereignty is tied up in like questions that are sort of rightly in the jurisdiction of Zen to just slice through with a no bullshit attitude about like how sovereign am I if I need a cup of coffee in the morning kind of questions. So, I don't know. Those are just my reflections, but I'd love for you to, to tear off with that in whatever direction you feel fit. Mm. Yeah. Well, such a beautiful reflection. And I do feel it's, important and also just accurate to emphasize that everything in the blog and everything in my practice with psyche with zen it's it's all fucked up and flawed and it's it falls short and it by design is you probably are familiar with this i can't remember which developmentalist came up with it but there's a child developmental person who has this phrase 80 percent good enough parenting and the idea is that 100% good enough parenting actually turns out less healthy kids than 80% good enough parenting. And in my relationship with the Mantid entity, with Zen, with Psyche, I have a personality trait where I sometimes feel desirous to hold things behind the curtain until they're perfect enough, or they're complete enough, or they're polished enough. And so... I do this with my language. I did it with the blog. I've done it with my own honesty around the ontological status of these entities, etc. And I had this 
argument with him as well, saying, I don't want to say this shit publicly. I'm not, you know, I'm a shitty spiritual practitioner. I'm a totally fucked up, flawed human being. I don't want to hold forth and say something. And they were so emphatic in response with, again, the one of the consensus is that they have consensi. What's the what's the plural of consensus? Um, was doing nothing is so much shittier than doing something flawed. You're being so selfish. It's actually so selfish to just share nothing and not participate because you know it will be flawed. You know it will be partial, and that's still true. But yeah, I want to. Return back to the, a sentiment in the earlier portion of our conversation, which is just, I could be wrong about a ton of this shit. I'm trying to find a balance between stating honestly and clearly that which I emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually feel to be very much the case. I have a lot of confidence in what I put into the blog, but I'm partial, limited, and flawed. So I'm assuming in the coming decades, centuries, and millennia, aspects of knowledge and apprehension will emerge and arrive for us that are going to correct the partial flawed portions of what I've shared and participated in. I hope for that to happen. But I also feel like there's so much noise and garbage and confusion. And that, again, to go back to John Mack and, and how lucky I was to get to have the time with him that I did and how generous he was with his life. That was another factor for me where I began to feel crappy knowing how fearless he was ready to go forth and risk everything because he had this advocacy for human beings and souls and love and for our place in the cosmos and how reticent and mm -hmm. reluctant I was being just felt like a shitty way to not celebrate and appreciate the gifts that he had given me and others. So I just wanted to get on the team, basically, and try to help. And I hope to be able to help better in more deep and expanded ways. But for right now, this is what it looks like. So, yeah, let's. this seems like a good time, first of all, to acknowledge the uh, commendable nature of your, your quest here. But then to dig into the details of, of this blog entry and what is based on all of your experience with this stuff, yeah. based on all your conversations, based on the enviable purity of your Zen sharpened awareness, <laughs> which I admire from, from down here in the, the murk <laughs> of my, you know, immersion in social purity. media, which you know, uh, Richard Doyle, God bless him. You know, someone I consider, you know, one of one of my my rare handfuls of, you know, like someone who's who's guided me along the the spiritual path. Rich Doyle has just no patience for social media anymore, and like actually slapped me with the proverbial wooden stick once when I sent him a GIF that I I found very humorous of an alligator snapping turtle biting someone on the ass. Just told me it was it was total noise and a waste of my time, and actually actually scolded me in the vein of this specific issue, which is you are allowing these discarnate entity with you, that there's something about participating in the, in the, what we think of, what we'd like to think of in the, as the digital commons as a form of spirit possession, you know, that we are, we're being bad by memes. And so we had this amazing argument about, I, I mean, it was awful, but it was, I think, excellent in the, in the way that yeah. ecstatic things are about whether you know, t t just how far you want to push the notion of spiritual antibiotics, I guess, you know, or like how, how dirty you're willing to be, you know, how many, <laughs> how many, how many, uh, you know, I took, again, to call it yeah. Kate Torvaldson's episodes, how many <laughs> implants is too many, you know? <laughs> so, you know, this, and, and, uh, and I think I owe you I'll tell my boss I'll be late for work and I owe you a right. story about that wow. stuff I did not tell on your your podcast. But but I want to invite this question, which is Yes, you do. Just That's you know, correct. what do you consider to be good spiritual hygiene when it comes to this kind of stuff? And how does you know, how does that reflect, I guess, 
the cosmology, the epistemology that you've developed about the nature of identity after 20 years as a Zen practitioner? You know, how does how do you feel that that's that's shaped your interdimensional diplomatic relations tactics? Mm. Fascinating. Well, to begin with that last portion on the Zen fold in here, I would say that I definitely find the ego to be a nexus of delusion, frontal structure, biology, aggregation, and accretion of story, etc. I like Eric Wargo's description of it going uh, through this, I forget what he calls it, a, a time, he sees the self as this continuation, he's got this other dimension to it, which I feel is a much closer approximation of what the seat of identity may be more like in that fashion. For me, I feel that I love how Sean says, take it seriously, hold it lightly. And that's one way that I regard my identity. And I no longer feel as I did in the beginning portion of Zen, this, you know, the the immature honeymoon where you think the identity is the enemy and you're going to vanquish it. I think that's as silly as, as anchoring yourself in it. It's one of the things that arises in experience. It can be an ally. It can be an adversary. And I feel like within the question, for instance, of the non-human entities and contact and hygiene, it's best to work with it. It's best to not create oppositional dynamics where none are necessary. And then the only other thing I'll say about the self is that I've come to regard it as a choir. And you need a choir director, and you don't want the choir director to be the most adolescent or undeveloped or vile, greedy voice in the choir. But also, you don't want to kick voices out of the choir. Uh, You could think vertically, horizontally, however you want to identify voices. There are, in my experience, a legion of them. There's a Mormon tabernacle choir inside of anyone, and they all need to sing. And if we don't allow them to sing, just like any other voice and perspective, it gets pissed off and it will find a way to assert itself. So it'll go under the bleachers, it'll dig a tunnel, it'll try to take over and become the choir director, whatever it is, sabotage other voices, like sing out of tune, it's just better to include and embrace and then try to get healthier versions of all of these facets of identity. So I see the identity now as that Mormon tabernacle choir more so than uh, any particular fixity. In regard to the hygiene, what is interesting about that is it's this next thing that came immediately after the directive of or I would say encouragement. I wasn't ordered by Psyche or the Mantid to do anything. Another the thing that both of them agreed on was, listen, do what you want, how you want to do it, but do it. Stop not doing anything. Stop not saying anything. You know that the distortion feedback loop inside of you is amplifying because you're not speaking. And then I was the voice that was stifling myself. So the constellation that was floating within the conversation within the argument for these years included hygiene and psyche was the first to say your practice every day should begin with a banishing but then also the positive inversion of that which is a welcoming so you want to identify your allies guides ancestors who have explicitly declared and proven their presence and effort is toward love and healing And they've signed on with the terms and the agreements that you have laid out and they want to participate and they want you to participate with those qualifications. Every day, begin with banishing, then move on to the positive inversion of working with all of them and celebrating them. And then importantly, conclude with uh, conclude the preliminary part of the practice by offering yourself to them as well, because these discarnate entities, whether they are were previously human, or maybe they never have been human. But if they're truly our guides and allies, they also have objectives and goals that they want to achieve. And when they're close, and they have proven themselves, you should 
want to participate. They need help as well. So don't forget to do that part. But the hygiene part, there's many different kinds of banishing. Um, I would say probably any of them work. I just was, uh, one was demonstrated to me by Psyche and she was basically like, if this fits and works, then use it. And I did, and it does. And I find it wonderful. So how much <laughs> hygiene, the implant question, it's like how many implants is too many implants. I love that question. 35 would be too many for me. It's not for Kat Torvaldson. But I will say that the one that I feel convicted that I have, which is in my shoulder, and that's mentioned in the Man Meets Man to this documentary. I find this question of hygiene in regard to implants fascinating because I wanted to have mine removed. I had been making plans. Many people may have seen Jeremy Corbell's documentary, Patient 17, I believe it is. You can easily find it on Netflix and Amazon. And it's the story of this one of these people, and there are many, who has his implant removed and analyzed with cutting edge technology. There's some very weird isotopic profiles that strongly hint that its exotic nature may be, in fact, from a non human origin, although that's not resolved with any completely binary satisfaction. But to my implant, I was thinking about getting it removed A, just to get it out of my body, B, because I wanted to have it analyzed. And I was told very oh. clearly by this mantid entity, don't do that. That implant is actually sending a hands-off signal. It is something that is keeping other entities from interacting with you. And, and chief among them, grays. One of the reasons you don't have grays in your life is because of this thing. It sends out a don't touch, this is mine kind of, not mine, not in a possessive sense, but a hands-off signal. It said that very clearly. <clears throat> And if you remove that, basically, I can't guarantee and vouch for the continuation of this part of your life that you've appreciated. And it's true. I do appreciate not having grays in my life. And I don't want them in my family's life, etc. So, but what's fascinating about that is like, what a brilliant <laughs> chess move. Because of course, I'm never going to know if that's, how, how will I verify that? The only way to verify it is to remove the implant, right? And do I want... Or would I benefit from taking that risk? Of course, this intelligence could see many chess moves down the line and know that just by saying that, I'm not going to remove it. And so I have not removed it. And years later, you know, uh, my daughter has come to me and said she has an implant as well. And there have been other layers of this that have unfolded. But suffice to say, I left the implant in. And I would say that that is a puncturing of the membrane of hygiene that I have permitted. So how much, how much toxicity am I allowing to allow, allow in my uh, ecosystem? I would say that much I'm allowing for that. And then I'm not perfect as well. There are days that I don't meditate and don't do a banishing practice. That probably creates some degree of increase in permeability. I don't know how much I tend to, I've not had some breach that has resulted in a truly unworkable dynamic in my life. So I feel like my hygiene is generally functioning where I need it to, how I need it to. Uh, and the other thing that I'll say about that before just handing it back to you is that I am also now a big fan of the team approach. Whereas for a long time in Zen, just a person on a cushion staring at a wall and bringing the attention back to the witnessing awareness over and over again, whether it was an entity or a thought or a desire. And now my spiritual life is much more like the inside of a Vajrayana temple. It's just full of there's a lot of folks involved. It's like a family reunion kind of feeling every day. And it's a big team effort. And I feel much better, safer. And also, I would say probably vitalized by that dynamic more so, which is funny because I'm an introvert and an isolationist more typologically. With that, I'll pause. Mm, it, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to magnify, emphasize about this blog is tenant nine, work with the visitors that do respect these tenants, um, that, that respect your sovereignty. I've been thinking about this a lot where, you know, in terms of, 
again, living in the ninth circle of hell that is yeah. Facebook and doing, you know, professional social media, you know, where I have, you know, friends that are like, if you, it's a moral decision, you have to kill your profile. And me being like, well, that's great, but it's a moral decision to feed my kid, you know? <laughs> so, it's, so, you know, in, in that space, it, it sort of inflames the male mammal horn interlocking jousting kind of BS that I've inherited. You know, that there's, <laughs> there's this thing about trying to reconcile, wanting everyone to get along with the affordances of our digital lives now. And so I, I guess I'm bringing this back into the mundane as a sort of token gesture or performance of what I'm talking about, this this deep, passionate, heartfelt desire to, you know, to be a force of integration, to try and mitigate the political polarization that we're experiencing now before it causes, you know, the social equivalent of a lightning strike. And it was interesting, I don't know, just to think about in this conversation around hygiene, I think, you know, one of the things it's good to hear you talk about compromise, I guess, is what I'm saying. And it's it's good to it's good to hear you uh, indulge a little bit of this not knowing in in terms of, you know, what it means to accept certain invasions of your physical envelope in exchange mm -hmm. for certain promised solitude of mm -hmm. a kind, because there's something about this idea of blocking, which feels very much like we haven't really talked about shadow work on this call, but that was a big piece of integral philosophy and the, you know, the, the practice of integral philosophy in one's life. And this, I, yeah. you know, I talk about this on your show about how learning to do shadow work really changed my relationship to what I would otherwise have thought as something outside of me, like literally like poltergeist stuff in the house and, and this yeah. kind of thing. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's just like there is a certain mundane concern surrounding when is it okay to block somebody, you know, versus yeah. when is that just creating, when is that just forcing the issue under the surface where it can't be addressed? And this question of tenant nine invisible corollary A might be like, when must you work? with visitors that do not respect these tenets and like, how oh. do you work with them? <laughs> Assuming that you're, we're, we're not just completely outgunned, um, yeah. you know, that we're not in some sort of like theological sense, just like you suggested, it's like, well, how would I know, you know, like we're, yeah. we are perfectly vulnerable to these things, which brings me to the story that I wanted to tell you. And I don't, I, I may leave this. I don't know. I feel weird even talking about this publicly, but that's that's a good sign, right? Follow that. Yes, um, it is. Uh, so take off your clothes and walk into the story. Yeah. <laughs> so you and I have a friend whose name I will likely edit out of this episode. Yes. Who, before I was working with him back in 2009, he was living in a little studio apartment in Venice. You know, real, real tiny place. It was just him and his books and like not even a kitchen. He had like a little hot plate. And, you know, doing the metropolitan monastic thing. And I was in Phoenix at the time. And I woke up from a dream about him and two other friends of mine. Oddly, I only remember who one of the other two people were in the dream. But I remember waking up from this dream and sending the, all three of them an email because I was very concerned about them. Because to kind of call to your Greek theater mythology thing here, this dream was about me hanging out in the audience of a, a mostly empty auditorium, like a high school size auditorium and watching on stage, my three friends standing on like choir risers behind three actors that were learning to portray them. And they kind of had their hands on their sh the shoulders of the actors and were giving them like a transmission of, and there were about, a, I think, a dozen of us in the audience watching this, supervising this rehearsal. And suddenly I felt uh -huh. this strong calling to go outside into the lobby of the theater, which 
for whatever reason, I guess, was like the Arizona State University Theater, which I've, I've never been to. I'm sure it's much larger than it was in my dream, but it was in this big concrete and glass building in Tempe that I was in in the dream. And I went out to the lobby and there standing in the entrance was a gray. And I've never had any kind of waking encounters with these beings, but I knew that this was the beckoning that I had received was from this this being that introduced itself to me as Malaclips the Elder, which I didn't know from Adam. I mean, I, I, I found out when I woke up from this dream a little bit about that. But this being said to me that my friends were in danger of being violated, of being exploited or compromised, kind of like a cybersecurity, you know, like getting hacked in some way. And I woke up from that dream and at first I was like, wait a minute, Malaclips the Elder. And I looked it up and, and Malaclips the Younger is a character in Robert Anton Wilson's Illuminatus trilogy, which I still have not read, hmm. but it was the sort of trickster, trans-ethical magician, I guess. Malaclips the Elder is a possibly legendary historical magician that was uh, supposed to have ascended in a magical rite that was fueled by, I think, some 14th century battlefield bloodshed, like this massacre from the Middle Ages that he exploited for his ascension. And so, like, whenever either of these entities appears in fiction or in history, they have this sort of, what would you call that, uh, chaotic neutral Chaotic, you know, yeah. um, Dungeons and Dragons disposition or whatever, maybe like possibly chaotic yeah. evil. And I was like, oh, crap. So I emailed my friends and I said, I think that you should just know that I had this dream and that I felt like I was given a warning about you. And our friend emailed me back immediately and said, well, that's funny because I woke up alone in my apartment with this. And he sent me a photograph from his iPhone of a perfect maybe three or four millimeter square, maybe two millimeter deep patch of skin that had been removed from the inside of his wrist. Oh God. And I was like, what the fuck? And it wasn't until years later that he and I had a kind of a tragic, horrible falling out a few years ago. And you know, it seemed like it was around him having uh, like memory problems, like not remembering conversations that we had and then getting angry at me for taking action in a way that he felt was like challenging to his authority over me in a, in a business relationship. But I was like, but we had this conversation and like, it was very, it was all very strange and I ended up feeling like I couldn't hold anything against him because I didn't feel like, I felt like he had been compromised in some way. And it was, I, I had remembered that around the time I had that dream, he was in a car accident. He had been hit from behind and had a spontaneous Kundalini awakening because of his spinal injury and had to work with healers for months because he was basically like not completely in his body at that time that he, he was looking in the mirror and just watching prior incarnations peeling off of him. You know, like Holy just shit. like he was he was like tripping balls for months because of this car accident. And that was like around the time that I had this dream or this gray. I was like, son of a bitch that I was watching him. I was guarding him. And this thing lured yeah. me outside to tell me that he was in danger, which was like a like clever girl velociraptor move. I was like my attention yeah. was drawn somewhere else when I should have been guarding the door, you know? And doubly ironic because it used the sentiment of protection in order to create the compromise. Yeah. Yeah. So an extremely, you know, not a place I want to end this conversation, <laughs> No, but like but a counter example to, you know, to like yeah. really anchor, drive home the seriousness of this kind of thing that you're talking about here. <laughs> it's so important. And I'm really glad you shared it, actually, because we just have to, well, we don't have to, but I think it behooves us to be honest about 
how complicated, confusing, and grave what is at hand is. It is very grave. It's very, if not beyond us, of an other order of sentience, often, at least parallel, often, perhaps beyond. But that in, in itself is a question, which is to what degree can we compare and contrast something that's utterly non-anthropomorphic, like a mantis intelligent, but with the grays and, and with this entity in this example, we just, <laughs> that's one of the points in the blog is this stop the binary approach, as Sean would say, mm. you know, embrace the doubleness. And the doubleness, one example would be that some of these entities within even particular varieties within a single category, you will find copious examples of deception, manipulation, chicanery, trauma, exploitation within and graze toward humans. But you will also find healing, humor, compassion, curiosity. It's just not simple. It's just not easy and reducible to any particular station in this matrix. And that example you just shared, I think, is a, is a great one in reminding us how, you know, one thing I do feel happy about and don't regret is how slowly and carefully I have transported myself over the last decade in regards to these questions. And even when I came to clarity on the stuff that I would eventually share in the blog, I didn't share it for a long time because I just kept pouring over it, moving my hands over the shape and textures of each of these items, double checking, triple checking, then wait, gestating more. And part of that impulse in us is love and concern for our fellow human beings. And the manner in which we are going to move forward collectively to bring us back around to number nine is necessitating that team facet, whether it's you in the dream, trying to protect your friends uh, in that theater of whatever was transpiring, or our fellow human beings or our fellow non-human beings. And number nine in the blog, which refers to work with the visitors that do respect these tenets, one of the not immediately obvious features of this is that the way we have divested ourselves of our relationship with the natives of our world, human and otherwise. So whether it's fey folk, the animating personhood of our trees, forests, all the living things that we have cohabitated with, that we have had the opportunity to be the ushers of, by divesting and dissociating ourselves from those presences and intelligence on this planet, we've also, of course, created a greater liability for ourselves in regards to things like non-human entities interacting with us, perhaps from other solar systems, but perhaps from just an adjacent dimension. Let's set that part of the question aside. But with the abduction phenomenon, to get really specific, if we had a completely thriving, robust relationship and were enforcing and strengthening our team here on Earth with all sentience, we would be in such a better position to respond, not only to respond, but to dictate, to set our terms and to say to these other intelligences, this is not your fucking world. This is not your property. And what you're doing is not permissible. And we decline. And you can come back when you're invited. That would be much more of an option to us than the zombified, insentient wandering that we're doing inwardly and outwardly, <laughs> staring at our fucking, sorry, pardon the French, you know, divesting ourselves and, and allowing this siphoning of interiority in a million different ways year over year. If we could just reverse that alone, so number nine, work with the visitors that do respect these tenants, we would be in such a better position if there was a coherence in our sentience, not only as humans, but as recognizing what our place is in this world and what a privilege and wonder it is to live among all these other sentiences. If we had respect uh, for a huge part of that, uh, entities that are in Sean Hargan's growing lexicon of, I forgot what he called that, the lexicon of 
types of intelligence. It's on, it's on a site. I'm sure you have the link to it already. But yeah, yeah, episode one fifty. Yeah. I think is yeah. Oh wow, you knew that off the top of your head. That's all. That's amazing. So I try, man. I try. So work with the visitors that do respect these tenets. That was also another thing that both the Mantid entity and Psyche uh, agreed on. And an interesting example of what number nine has teased out in aliens and artists the podcast there's an episode it's actually the first episode the first two episodes with nadine lalich she's a lifelong abductee contactee and she's also an incredibly amazing human being very deeply developed very beautiful rich cosmology and she has transformed her own relationship with these entities in a truly interesting way one detail in her experience that i find is really relevant to number nine in the blog work with the visitors that do respect these tenets she was on a craft and this was not long ago this was within i would say the last five or ten years and she i believe at this time she's maybe around 65 or 70 years old so she noted that after she went through menopause the variety and contact changed radically they no longer treated her when they took her as a biological specimen in which they wanted genetic material or reproductive material. Just suffice to say she was probably part of the hybridization program, et cetera. But when she went through menopause, that changed. And then she said that's when she started working with this one particular mantid entity, which she had not previously. It's like that mantid arrived after her menopause because that was the developmentally appropriate time for its working and testing and teaching with her to begin. And this particular experience she had, I find very informative to this item in the blog. She remembered, these are conscious memories, being on a craft and she was being tested by this mantid entity. It was a, a variety of not just IQ, but let's just call it more of an integral developmental testing procedure in which all kinds of fascinating holograms and manner in which they were interacting with her, which could elicit her variety of development. And the point of it, it was like a theater. It was almost like a medical theater that this test was occurring in. And the mantid was conducting the test with her and she was surrounded by, I don't remember the number, but a great variety of other beings. So tall grays, tall whites, you know, maybe strange cobalt ones. I don't remember, but there was a lot of different kinds of entities observing this test. And the point which this mantid was trying to make to these other entities was completing the test. It turned to them and basically communicated like, see, this is what human beings can become. Look at this. This is why we shouldn't stop trying. We could have a whole population of humans like her. And it was advocating and making a case, basically, to these other entities. And she reported that the response was sort of mixed. Some of them got it and agreed, and others of them were like, nope, it's pointless, <laughs> they're, they're worthless and beyond redemption. And there was there was not an agreement. But to the point of number nine, work with the visitors that do respect these tenets, the mantid entity telling me, you should be working with me. Because I'm one of these that actually thinks there's a point and a redemption and a value to human beings, and I'm advocating for you. And she was sharing this other story, which another iteration of that had occurred. And so that's the point behind number nine, which is to say, if we can find non-human intelligences that are going to respect our sovereignty and work to protect it, then we should work with them. And it'll probably also be confusing and complicated and fucked up and not satisfying all the time. And that's the part of the concession that you were referring to earlier. Yeah. Yes. Ole. Yeah. I, <laughs> we got to wrap soon, but I, I want to, yeah. uh, I want to first nod at the silver thread I see between everything that you just said and the conversation, I think we talked about this again when I was when I was on your show, when I was in the middle of a book club about Lilith's Brood by Octavia Butler and this this question of oh. of how that those books explore the issue of what it is to to consent when you are dealing with something truly alien. You know, that that both yeah. sides there is this this issue with 
the idea of informed consent, when you get into some of these deeper implications of a, you know, non-duality or like Galen Strawson's philosophy, where he takes it from a, a Western angle, but ends up climbing, a, you know, a very similar hill on the conditioning of our desires and how like your will is never truly free. And, you know, we can't model the whole world with a one-to-one -one map. So your, your model is never complete. And so your consent is never really informed, at least like, yeah. you know, it's like, it's, it's never perfectly informed. And, right. and so like, even in the question of, I think we're doing the right thing for our kids you know, that, that kind of, to bring yeah. it back into that, you know, don't drink the Drano kind of thing. It's like, well, I can be pretty sure she shouldn't drink the Drano, but you know, we get into all kinds of arguments, my wife and I, about the severity, like how, how badly do you want to fight about fluoridated toothpaste? Uh, yeah. You know, these, you know, how much screen time is enough? And obviously the kid can't give informed consent, but like the idea that these beings that we're interacting with in spite of their possibly being, you know, unfathomably beyond us in their, both their intelligence and their sort of moral capacity, at least some of them, oh. that they're still wrestling with perhaps even more than we are wrestling with these unanswerable questions about one more call to Kate Torvalson and how I loved how she said basically that she felt like she was a wild animal that had been caught and tagged. You mm -hmm. know, and that it was, yeah. it was like, yeah, it was scary, but I mean, it's, you know, it's scary to, a, you know, I, I remember chasing after toads as a kid. I love, I loved finding toads and they always <laughs> piss in your hands. You yeah. know, they're always like, oh God, oh God, it's the yeah. end. You know, <laughs> when you pick them up, even, yeah. no matter how much you love them, you know, a toad is still going to piss in your hand. And, you know, so that's, I think just, just having this kind of conversation with you is, is so so good for the soul in part because for me maybe the the ripest fruit on this this tree of discussion is the fruit of taking a copernican turn on what it means to be a human being like the the decentering that it does for us even even as it puts us you know like if you look at the the six realms of tibetan buddhism and yeah, like, of course, they're comfortable talking about all of these other entities because, you know, humans are like in one slice of that pie. And then yeah. but it's like but it's not the it's not the middle of the pie. It's 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 like, <laughs> you know, it's like there's 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 a big like gaping abyss in the middle. And then all of us are like hanging around eating the pie from the outside in, you know, yeah. so I don't know. End rant. I'll let you. Uh, I'll it. let you land this craft however you feel appropriate, Stuart. I, I just, I'm just super glad to have gotten you on the show and to be able to engage in this inquiry with you because it is really, I think, just such a profoundly important and and, and fascinating area. And you got to wear eclipse glasses to stare into the heart of it, but it's <laughs> it's worth it. You're doing a great job. Yeah. Oh man, it's a uh, it's so mutual, and I'm so encouraged and enabled to ask these kind of questions, put those glasses on, and start the eclipse scan because of your work, your podcast, because of Sean, because of Weird Studies and Gordon, and just a growing list, uh, including Bruce Alderman and the work he's doing with the series over there with Integral and UFOs and. I think the main thing just to land on in the spirit of what you just shared as well is just for us to cooperate in arriving and cultivating better questions, better ways of not knowing and, and more intimate, cosmologically relevant ways of not knowing. And, and to be more specific about it, I think one thing that I would love to see recede and dissolve is the older forms of the questions, which were of the variety of, is this even fucking real? Are UFOs, our entity or whatever, is, is something even happening? Is this just completely, I really don't think we can ask or should, I should say, ask that question anymore. I don't think that's the helpful question. I don't have the answers, but I think 
this shift and migration we're seeing within integral spiritual just consciousness populations in general moving more toward how do we tease this apart and how do we do it in a way that protects heals human beings but also recognizes we're part of something much more interesting than perhaps we have anticipated for a long time and then to finish with how important it is that we reconnect with our own cohabitating sentient neighbors on this planet, be they fae, be they nature, whatever it is, we have to start and include that in there as well. And all of the folks within this team that I know you're on, that I know JF and Phil are on, that I know Sean is on and so forth. I know we're all doing that and that I find to be really encouraging and a point of great hope. And that's where I'll land and just say thank you so much for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. I'm sending you big pandemic cosmic hugs <laughs> from you, our remote locales. <laughs> likewise, likewise. Folks, if you do not already know this, I think I mentioned, I, I will have mentioned this in the intro, that, that Stu is one of these obscene bukake level cornucopias of creative just superfluity and that uh this conversation like barely touches on all that he has contributed both intentionally and compulsively to our our creative commons i absolutely insist that you follow him on spotify or wherever it is you you listen to music that you follow him on youtube that you subscribe to all of his stuff you track his podcast you maintain negative capability and uh, you know a comfort in the cloud of unknowing in his honor <laughs> put a little picture of him up on your altar and and uh you know like offer him cereal and stuff every once in a while i don't know i just yeah i i just am always excited it's you're you're a, a real bomb on the on the wound of feeling like I'm too much for people. If I ever feel that way, oh. I just go, at least there's Stuart Davis. <laughs> <laughs> That's a beautiful sentiment. And I will tuck it inside the silky fold of my most precious hold and keep and cherish it like uh, an ember that lit those fires in the primordial times over and over again. I...
There's a tendency to think that it's the practical senses that get these questions solved. Those are tenuous tools, and the more we employ them, the slower that we evolve. Denied by suppression. Thanks again for listening. Future Fossils is an independent, ad-free, entirely listener-supported program. 
if you believe in the work that I'm doing and you want to help see it thrive into the unimaginable future, then you can avail yourself of all of the backstage goodies at patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. Or you can just leave a review at Apple Podcasts. That's more helpful than you know. Reach out to me personally at Michael Garfield on Twitter or Instagram and have a wonderful eon. <laughs>